model implied instrument of variables is another technique for estimating latent variable models. This is not really a mainstream technique in management, but it has received some attention recently and there are a couple of high profile methodological papers that advocate this technique. The technique is also useful for diagnostics and it's useful if you want to understand what instrument of variables do. So let's take a look at what model implied instrument of variables estimation technique for latent variable models does. When we have a latent variable model, the problem is that we're interested in, in the latent variables A and B, but we don't observe those variables directly, rather we observe indicators. We have A1, A2 and A3, B1, B2 and B3, and these indicators contain variance from the latent variable, the A's and B's, but they also contain error, the E's, the unreliability, and the specific variance, the Q, W and R, S, T and, and Y. And the first technique that we learn when we start working with this kind of models is just to take a sum of the indicators and run a regression analysis. The problem with regression analysis of scale scores that is that if those scale scores are contaminated with measurement error, which they pretty much always are, then the regression coefficients will be inconsistent and biased. The problem is really the measurement error of the independent variable. The reason why the measurement error of the dependent variable is not problematic because the measurement error is, is assumed to be uncorrelated with, uh, with the factors, so it just goes to the error term in this regression analysis. But there is no way for these measurement errors E and uh, Q, W and R to, to escape from the independent variable. We could fit a latent variable model with maximum likelihood estimation, but there are other techniques. The model implied instrument of variable technique has six steps or the analysis procedure that, that Bolland, who is the leading advocate of this technique, recommends an analysis of six steps. The first two steps, the model specification and identification, are the same with any other latent variable modeling approach. So the idea is that you first specify a model, then you ensure that the model is identified, so each latent variable must have a, a scale and must have sufficient number of indicators and so on. Then uh, you have uh, three steps that are unique to model implied instrument variable estimation. The first thing, step or step number three, is that you are uh, you, you do this latent to observed transformation. So basically you take some of these observed variables and use them as proxies for the latent variables. That produces inconsistent estimates in regression analysis, but you can do instrumental variable estimation. So you can use, if you use the A1 indicator as a proxy for, for the factor A and B1 indicator as a proxy for the factor B, you can use the remaining indicators or subset of them as instrumental variables. Then uh, you do instrumental variable estimation like two states least squares, which gives you the estimates and you can apply normal instrumental variable diagnostics, particularly for the exclusion criterion to test the model. Let's take a look at what this technique does. The first thing when we start analyzing this model with model implied instrumental variables, the first thing that we do is that we throw away indicators B2 and B3. So this is the base, base case. We could of course simply take a sum of B2, B3 and B1 and use that as a proxy. But we need to have one variable that is the proxy for the dependent variable B and one variable that is the proxy for the independent variable A. And uh, the recommended approach is to take the scaling indicator. So we take the scaling indicator A1, we take the scaling indicator B1, we proxy the latent variables with these indicators. Now we know that in this regression analysis, as I explained, if we simply regress B1 on A1, the estimates will be inconsistent and biased because of the estimation of the uh, measurement error in A1. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, econometricians have figured out that you can actually use instrumental variables to deal with this problem too. The way that we normally learn about instrumental variables is that we learn that they can be applied for Omitted variable bias, they can be applied to correct for simultaneous bias, but instrumental variables, importantly, can also be used to deal with measurement error. And it's sometimes referred to as a multiple indicator solution in econometrics, because we're using multiple indicators. And uh, for, for one variable, one of them is the, the proxy and, and the others serve as instruments. So how does it work? Well, it, it works that uh, we have, we want to estimate the regression between B and A, and we know that using A1 and B1 is going to cause 
the estimates to be biased and inconsistent. We can replace B with uh, B1, no problems, because um, the measurement error of B1 is going to go to the error term because it's uncorrelated. But now the problem here is that if we replace a with A1, we can have we can present it in two different ways. We will have uh, and uh, the, the measurement error of, of A1, if that goes to the error term, we will have an endogeneity problem because the indicator A1 will correlate with its own measurement error. So that leads to an endogeneity problem. However, if we take a look, closer look at this model, we can see that the measurement error of A1, the E and Q, they are uncorrelated with the, the, the indicators A2 and A3. So A2 and A3 are correlated with A1, but only because they share the variance from the latent variable, not because of the error term. So we actually have A2 and A3 that are relevant. They are correlated with A1, and they are also excluded because they don't correlate with the error term of A1, and they can be used as instrumental variables. What will then happen is that when we regress A1 and A2 and A3 in the first stage of a two-stage least score regression analysis, the errors are, can't, be, can't be predicted from these scores. They go to the error term and the fitted value of, of A1 can be used here in the regression analysis to explain uh, B1 and we will get a consistent estimate of beta. So this is the model implied instrumental variables approach. We find the instrumental variables, we need to find out instrumental variables that are uncorrelated with the measurement errors. Typically um, they, they will be either from, from other variables that are correlated or from the same latent variable. Then uh, we apply two states least squares GMM or we can use any other instrumental variable estimation technique then uh, we do model testing using Sargon test or any other standard test that we apply after instrument of our estimation. Here is a recent example of uh, this technique in, in action, article by, by Benjamin Tour and uh, his co-authors. And, and this, they, they explain uh, that they used instrumental variables. They said Bolin's work, they said Woolrich's work that talks about this as a multiple indicator solution. And uh, they, they mentioned endogeneity, which is a bit misleading because this is not really an endogeneity correction technique, but this is more about an estimating of a model that we assume to be correct that doesn't have endogeneity. So the endogeneity only occurs because we have measurement error in the indicators and that's the only kind of endogeneity then that this technique can deal with. Then they show the equations and what's interesting here is that the, the, the equation here is actually exponential because this is Poisson regression model. And uh, this model implied instrument of variables, at least Bolin's work and, and Woolridge's discussion on the multiple indicator solution, they only concern uh, the, the linear case. So they don't talk about nonlinear model, but uh, I did some simulations after conducting the authors and it seems that this approach actually works with uh, non-linear models as well, although I can't really explain why that's the case. But if I were to use this technique in non-linear models, I would probably uh, dig a bit deeper in the literature to find a proof that says that it actually works in that case too. So, so why would someone use this technique? So there's a bit of selling here, the endogeneity point is probably not, it, it's a bit misleading, but there are a couple of genuine advantages in, in this estimation technique. One is that it is more robust to measurement error with some caveats. This is from Bolin's article and they uh, generate data from this kind of model. So they have uh, latent variables measured with two indicators each and they have L1 and L2 regression coefficient 0.2, L2 and L3 regression coefficient 0.2 and then they have L1 and L3 regression coefficient 0.8 and they leave out this regression path so it's a full mediation model I mean and then they misspecify the model as full medias. Then they estimated with normal maximum likelihood and model implied instrument variables. What we can see here is that in the misspecified model, the factor loading estimates that they get don't vary between the misspecified model and, and the, when the correct model is estimated. So this misspecification in the latent variable model 
does not affect factor loading estimates. But it does affect the maximum likelihood estimates. And, and this tells us something important. When you have a, a maximum likelihood estimate or any other uh, full information estimate where you estimate everything together, you use all information from the sample to estimate the parameters, then the misspecification in one part of the model, the omitted one path, can cause all the other estimates in the model to be unbiased. But if you estimate it piece by piece, like you do with this uh, model implied instrument variable approach, you would, for example, estimate this, this L, L2 to, uh, to Z4 path uh, separately, then uh, that bias would not happen. So the effects of misspecification are local. So this is the, uh, the, 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 the key selling point of, of this technique. There are also other important advantages of this technique. The second is that it always provides estimates. So sometimes maximum likelihood estimation will fail and you don't know why it fails. Either your software will not converge or it will give you nonsense values or missing standard errors or something like that. It might be difficult to troubleshoot. But this will always give some kind of result. And because you are estimating one equation at a time in the system, it's easy to see where problems are located. So it's good for, for diagnostics. It's also easy to understand. If you understand instrument variable estimation and two stage least squares, you can simply run this model. Compared to maximum likelihood estimation, if you really want to understand why and how it works, you need to understand a bit of, of the theory behind maximum likelihood. Well, how do you calculate the likelihood? A bit of matrices because the models are, are calculated in a matrix form, uh, something about numerical optimization and so on. So you need to understand quite a lot to be able to really explain what your software does. In this approach, you only need to understand uh, what qualifies as an instrument variable and you need to understand two states of this course, both of which are pretty simple to do. Okay, but there are also some, some uh, disadvantages of this technique. I point them out in this email to SCMNet email list. And uh, the disadvantages are that the, the robustness against misspecification is, is kind of like not, not, it has a caveat. So the thing is that model implied instrument variables are robust for misspecification as long as that misspecification does not make any of your instruments uh, to be invalid. So if you have a, a misspecification that makes any of the variables that you use as instrumental variables invalid, then that misspecification will make the model implied instrumental variable estimates very bad, but maximum likelihood estimates are affected to a much lesser degree. And I use this, this metaphor of, of a steak. So if you uh, put too much salt in a steak, then in maximum likelihood estimation, the salt is spread all over the steak. So all estimates are biased to some extent, but the steak is still edible. It's just a bit too salty. If with model implied instrument variables, you put all the salt in one place. And uh, as long as you don't bite that one place, then uh, things are going to be fine. But if you bite that one place, it's completely inedible. So you're basically uh, getting robustness but you are, you are, what you trade is the, uh, the severity of the problem if it hits you. So if there is one part of the model that's misspecified, most of the time you are okay with model implied instrument variables. But when you're not okay, then the results are really bad. The second problem with model implied instrument variables is that it is less efficient. So originally in, in the basic case, if you have three indicators of, of the dependent variable, we just throw two away and throwing away information is generally not a good principle. But it's useful for diagnostics. So this is one tool in the toolbox and it probably should not be your only tool. Maximum likelihood estimation probably should not be your only tool either, but you need to have a toolbox where, from which you pick what is the right tool for a task. Some places where this is useful is, as I said, for diagnostics. So this is from status user manual and they uh, explain that one potential cause of problems in SCM estimation is that your starting values can be bad. And to understand why starting values could be bad, it's useful to understand where the starting values come from. 
Well, the starting values of, of Stata and many other SCM software are calculated using instrument variable techniques very similar to the MEV model implied instrument variable estimation technique that I, that I just presented. So if you see a weird starting value, then now you know where it comes from. Like many other techniques, this technique also has a couple of misconceptions. And I mentioned already in, in the tool paper that researchers seem to think that this technique has some uh, capability to deal with endogeneity. It does not. So this is a very explicit example. Uh, this uh, model implied instrument variable technique is used for, for testing for omitted variable bias. It just can't do that. There is no evidence that it would be able to do that. And there is no reason that it, it could. But nevertheless, these researchers say, claim that it could without any evidence. They cite Bolland's work, which is the relevant work to cite when you use this technique, but Bolland makes no such claims. And uh, well, if you take a look at this recent article in Journal of Management for how to deal with endogeneity, they also mention model implied instrumental variable techniques as, as one potentially useful technique. It's not useful technique for dealing with endogeneity. It is useful technique for estimating latent variable models. But if that latent variable model, if there's endogeneity between the latent variables, then this technique doesn't do anything. Finally, how do you apply the technique? The technique is basically an application of two stage least squares, which is a fairly basic thing to do. The hard part is to identify the instruments. Fortunately, there are two good software packages for finding the instruments. Baldry has uh, programmed a me search or me find package for Stata, where you input your model and then it gives you uh, the instrument of variables. Then you put them into the two stage least squares or whatever. And then uh, uh, Fisher has written a package for R that does the instrument search and also estimation of model implied instrument variable estimates. And uh, I actually programmed the instrument search uh, algorithm for, for this software package because the original algorithm was pretty slow and I needed it for a paper that could be a bit faster. So model implied instrument variables is, is certainly worth learning about because it's useful for diagnostics. If your model does not converge, then running it one equation at a time with this model that this approach that always gives you results can give you useful information for troubleshooting. But should this model or this estimation approach completely replace maximum likelihood estimates? For most research and most use cases, probably not. It's another way of, of the estimating that has different advantages than maximum likelihood estimates, but I would still go for ML estimates as a default alternative.